Hello, everyone, and welcome to the culinary breakout of this third week of Menus of Change. I'm Anne McBride, the Deputy Director of the Torribera Mediterranean Center, a joint project of the CIA and the University of Barcelona. And today on this culinary stage, we are heading to India for a fascinating exploration into a country rich in plan forward inspiration. Culture, religion, and geography play key roles in defining regional Indian cuisines. And we'll learn more about that from Thomas Zacharias, the chef partner of the Bombay Canteen, a modern regional Indian restaurant in Mumbai. Thomas's food philosophy involves showcasing Indian cuisine in a new and contemporary avatar, celebrating indigenous local and seasonal ingredients, and creating memorable food experiences around Indian cuisines. Thomas, whom we are proud to claim as a CIA graduate, is joining us today from Mumbai, where it is late evening. Welcome, Thomas. Will appear with us in a second. Hi. Hi. Hi, Anne. It's so good to see you. Good to see you, too. How is everything in Mumbai? It's great. Uh, I, I should correct you. It's, it's more than late evening. It's almost midnight. Oh. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it's actually, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay safe with uh, the heavy thunderstorms and flooding in Mumbai. So uh, I'm all cooped up. I don't think we've had rains like this in the last 15 years. So um, yeah, so it's, a, it's fun time. If we, if we had, already didn't have enough to deal with. <laughs> right. You had locusts, didn't you? Also a few weeks ago, a few months ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but that was, I mean, it, it didn't reach the city, it didn't reach uh, Mumbai, but yeah, towards the northwestern uh, part of the country, it got pretty badly hit. Yes, 2020 is really trying to hit every level in the books, right? <laughs> oh, you have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're very happy that you are joining us. And I will actually add in the chat your Instagram handle because we get Thomas today for half an hour, but he has been through um, before the pandemic already, but especially during doing tons of uh, online tr uh, videos and really, really great content. So um, for you guys watching to continue your education about uh, Indian regional Indian cuisines after this session, make sure you follow Thomas on Instagram. Um, and uh, we'll be watching a couple of demos. Enter your questions for Thomas in the chat at any time, and we'll have times we'll have time during the session for Thomas to be answering them. Um, but without further ado, why don't you introduce the first demo we're going to be watching? Sure. Uh, so before we watch the first uh, video, I think I, I need to lay some ground rules. Uh, first, you need to get rid of all the preconceived notions you have about Indian food. Um, uh, I, I think Indian food is typically known to be like greasy and heavy on the spices, but uh, that's not really how we eat in India. So uh, throw away all those stereotypes. Um, I've picked uh, two really wonderful, uh, very humble recipes from different parts of India today. The first one is called the Shukto, uh, which comes from West Bengal. And what I love about this dish is uh, one, it it pays homage to the fact that uh, the, the people in West Bengal eat a coarse-wise meal. And this dish, uh, because of its bitter element, uh, is the first uh, course of that of that meal. So I th I, I really found, uh, I was fascinated by that little uh, bit of uh, nuanced information in there. Um, and also, it, it, I, I think we very, very rarely do we find in, uh, in the conversation around food that bitterness is not something you want to shy away from. Uh, so in this case, the, the the bitter element that's coming from the bitter gourd uh, is actually meant to whet the appetite. But I mean, the rest is in the video. Great. And yes, bitter is definitely not a flavor, especially in the U.S. that people crave, right? So this idea of yeah. thinking of it as something that also works with your appetite is really interesting. All right. So let's watch it and we'll uh, see you again shortly. Yep. Let's roll the video. So I'm going to show you the recipe of how to make a shukto. Uh, now, the shukto is a dish from uh, West Bengal, which incidentally is from the eastern part of India. Uh, and the West Bengal is known for a cuisine that has this very strong focus on seasonality and uh, of, uh, a love for mustard. Typically, the shukto uh, is a dish with a bitter profile that uh, is eaten at the beginning of the meal. Now, the Bengalis believe in a multi-course meal. Long before we came up with fancy tasting menus with multiple courses, the Bengalis had a course-wise uh, tasting menu of sorts at home. 
uh, and the first dish of the meal will always start with something bitter because it is believed to whet the appetite and also kind of get the digestive juices flowing. The shukto uh, in essence is a really simple dish and uh, let's get into the ingredients first. We have the potatoes, the karela or bitter gourd, we have drumsticks, uh, eggplants and raw banana or green banana. We also have some whole dried red chilies, ginger, green chilies. And then we have this mixture of spice spices, which is uh, the black mustard seeds, cumin seeds, fenugreek seeds, fennel seeds, and nigella seeds. Uh, we also need some more black mustard seeds uh, along with some poppy seeds, which we're going to soak and grind into a paste. And uh, we have turmeric powder, milk, some uh, regular vegetable oil, and uh, salt. So first you prep all the ingredients. The ginger and the green chilies are made into a paste. Uh, we also have to soak the mustard and the poppy seeds uh, with some hot water for about 10-15 minutes and then grind that into a paste as well. And uh, then we prep the vegetables. Uh, everything is cut into uh, battens about uh, 2 inches long. And then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to season them with a little bit of salt. Now the salt does is it's going to bring out the moisture and in the, in the process also bring out the bitter juices so in the, in the end make it a little less bitter than it should be. Uh, green or raw banana, what we're going to do is we're going to separate them and uh, take out the peels uh, just kind of leaving uh, half an inch of a space in between. So you want to take out the fibrous parts of the peel but leave some in there because the peels also add a lot of flavor and a little bit of texture. So uh, you kind of find a middle ground and these peels can be used later, they can be uh, fried into crisps or they can be added to stir fries. You just want to make sure when you cut them, uh, we keep them in water so they don't discolor, they tend to oxidize a lot. That looks about good. Going to turn that off and we're going to take this traditional Indian mortar and pestle and grind these up. So they're nice and toasted. Um, and the reason for kind of grinding them on a mortar and pestle is because you don't want it too fine into a powder. You want to keep it kind of coarse uh, because uh, then it contributes to that little bit of texture at the end of the dish. So the first step is to uh, cook out the bitter gourd and uh, we're going to saute it. See, the oil is pretty hot. I'm going to add them. Okay, so uh, that looks like it's uh, done. So what I'm going to do is uh, transfer that on the same pot, add a few more tablespoons of oil and you could use any vegetable oil. Uh, And we're going to add the whole red chilies and we'll just take off the, the kind of stems here, add them in there, let them bloom a little bit. When you see that it's all nice and puffy, um, add the green chili and ginger paste, mix it together. What you're going to do is uh, kind of get rid of the raw flavor of the ginger. And as soon as that happens, which happens really quickly, you can add the vegetables. So the potatoes, the green banana, the eggplant, and the drumstick. Season these pretty generously. And let them saute on a medium to high flame. Okay, so once you see that uh, a lot of the water has evaporated, it's cooked down a little bit. What you want to do is uh, add a little bit of turmeric. And then top it off with uh, water. Just about enough water to cover. And you also want to add in the mustard and poppy seed paste. 
Now these vegetables, you can substitute these vegetables for other vegetables as well. You try and just want to make sure that you have uh, at least one bitter element in there. So if you don't have access to bitter gourd uh, or karela, what you can also do is add something like uh, radicchio or uh, even uh, arugula leaves. So you're going to let this cook for about uh, five to seven minutes on a gentle simmer. All right, so that's now been cooking for a total of about 15 minutes. The vegetables are almost done. Um, and right when they're almost done, what we're going to do is uh, add the milk. We don't want to add this earlier because there's a tendency for the milk to split. I'm also going to kind of balance the uh, uh, bitterness of the bitter gourd uh, with a little bit of uh, jaggery. But you can add cassia sugar or brown sugar as well. And of course, we're going to finish with uh, some of the toasted ground punch for him. I'm going to keep some for garnish, but add about a teaspoon. Just mix it all together. I'm going to let it cool. As it cools, it's going to kind of absorb, get absorbed by the vegetables, and all the flavors are going to kind of mellow down get uh, homogeneous and delicious and we're good to go uh, that's your bengali shukto i hope you guys enjoy this dish wonderful i definitely enjoyed it <laughs> uh thomas we have a question for you are the bananas the same type that we find in u.s supermarkets or are they more similar to a plantain so they're actually green plantains uh, so they're more similar to green plantains the unripe uh plantain yeah and they definitely i mean when you were cutting it 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 was crunchy right so it's definitely on the very unripe side of a definitely yeah it's it's completely unripe and it's actually used very uh commonly in a lot of indian cuisines because it's it's actually banana is a perennial uh, plant so it's actually available throughout the year uh, so you find it all over all over india especially in the tropical parts of india and uh, the drumstick is the same thing as moringa. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so moringa is the name of the tree, uh, and uh, the, the drumstick is the stalk part of that tree. And so here we tend to have the you know the, the leaves ground into powder to include in your smoothies as the superfood. <laughs> Do the stalks <laughs> have the same uh, beneficial properties? Uh, it has a lot of the same beneficial properties, but uh, the leaves are more potent. But it's funny you say that because uh, in India, uh, I mean, it's been such an important part of our culture for so many centuries, but uh, uh, modern India, or urban India woke up to this superfood only when America recognized it. So it, it kind of, it, it, and that's, that's what we'll get to a little later in this conversation. Uh, that's mm -hmm. that is the problem that needs to be solved. Yeah, and that's something, you know, it's the same in Africa, it's the same in the West Indies, all these places that have used Moringa leaves and other ingredients for a long time. And then and, and then suddenly they become highly unaffordable for lo for local yeah. communities, right? Yeah. We have a, uh, some more questions. So uh, I'll group Greg's two, que two questions into one. What are the best selling vegetable centric dishes in your restaurants? And there are have have there been vegetable or vegetarian dishes that you've loved but couldn't get your customers excited about? So, um, the Bombay Cafe is one of the few restaurants in India, and this might seem sound odd to a lot of uh, viewers today. Uh, one of the few restaurants that has a seasonal menu. Um, so we keep changing our menus. We we use only indigenous uh, produce. Um, and so we've had, I mean, over the last five years, I've explored about 150 vegetables on our menu. Um, now in India, the, the, the most common vegetables that people love to eat the, these days are potato, um, green bell peppers, uh, cauliflower and, uh, paneer, which they consider a vegetable, but it's actually a cheese. Uh, so typically, I mean, by default, a lot of these vegetables do become more popular, but what I'm trying to steer people away from is, and like get them exposed to is this entire plethora of uh, incredible produce that's out there. So the idea is to keep keep the menu evolving uh, and introduce uh, exciting forms of uh, a lot of these indigenous vegetables. Uh, to answer Greg's second question, and hi, Greg, it's so good to see you again. Um, 
we have uh, had vegetables uh, I, i think one of the vegetables that featured here which is the bitter gourd uh, is a hard vegetable to uh, digest if you if you're not a fan of it uh, so you have to think of creative ways of incorporating it uh, maybe like in this dish where it's not the center of the dish and it's just one of those players um, that's one way to do it or uh, karela or bitter gourd actually if you slice it and fry it, it makes for amazing chips so you just have to think creatively about how you can get indians actually be excited about uh, indian produce and that's an important point right it's not because someone is indian that they will necessarily like indian ingredients or you know indian flavors the the same way that an american might not like a burger or a swiss a fondue absolutely but in india it's a little different because uh, the average person the average urban indian doesn't eat more than a dozen or two dozen vegetables throughout the course of the year uh like seasonality exists within our cuisines but we've kind of forgotten it and we've basically eat the same 10 or 12 vegetables which are available throughout the year um and and that's why it's important to again highlight these lesser known vegetables highlight these vegetables which are so intrinsic to our culture but we've kind of forgotten over the past couple of decades and we'll talk about that after your next video right we'll talk about your wild food programs uh but why don't yeah. you introduce the the second dish that we're going to watch yeah so the second uh, dish is uh, called the mandi uh and this comes from uh the so west bengal is in the eastern part of the country uh the mandi comes from tamil nadu uh, and a region tamil nadu is in the south eastern part of the country Uh, a region called Chetanad, which is actually uh, uh, about 70 villages, uh, a community of 70 villages that come together, um, and it's primarily an arid region. And the cuisine is known to be uh, predominantly meat uh, heavy, but it's actually not true. I've actually traveled to those regions and I've discovered that there's incredible uh, vegetarian uh, dishes within this cuisine, and this is one of those dishes. And uh, what I love about this dish is, is that it highlights frugality. uh you basically make do with uh may make the best of what you have available with you uh so i don't want to reveal what the the frugal element is which i think we should just watch the video and see great and it's definitely a, re- a revelation so i love that and, and it, it, it was to me as well it was i mean i i the first time i saw it i was blown away like why didn't i think of that um <laughs> and and that's what i think like young indian chefs who are just getting into the industry need to realize that We don't need to look to the west for exciting concepts and techniques. We have them all here. Great. And so now that we've really teased it out and there's a lot of suspense, <laughs> <laughs> let's watch the video and uh Lori, I see your question in the chat. We'll make sure we get to that when we come back. So, let's watch yeah. the video. Mandi is actually uh rice water. And this is what I love about this dish is uh that in in being uh not wasteful with food. basically what they would do is all the water uh, left over from soaking rice wouldn't be thrown away it would be used as like a cooking liquid for uh, a dish and this dish uh, would be called mandi because this left over rice soaking water would be called arisi mandi or rice water you can make this with a lot of different vegetables from potatoes to beans carrots pumpkin but uh, my favorite rendition is with uh, bindi Oh, uh, vendakai. So this is going to be the vendakai mandi, and uh, I'll take you through all the ingredients. You obviously have the vendakai or the bindi or the okra. There's onions, um, preferably I like to use like shallots, but I don't have any, so I'm going to use baby onions instead. We have some tomatoes. Uh, we have uh, these small fat round chilies called gundu mulagai. Um, green chilies, tamarind. some uh, garlic curry leaves we have uh, some hing black mustard seeds fenugreek or methi seeds sesame oil i'm going to use sesame oil as cooking medium here some urad dal and of course uh, the rice i mean this is just uh, rice which is not been soaked but we're going to make the mandi out of this which i'm going to show you how to wash the rice uh, and kind of uh, drain that water because it will have some impurities and then um, you add water to soak the rice in and uh, rubbing the rice with your hands uh, and what this does is uh, you're basically kind of releasing the starch from the rice um typically what you would do while you're boiling rice and uh, that's what the chettiyars did as well and the only difference was instead of throwing away this water which 
all of us do all the time. Uh, it's this really cool technique of actually saving this water and uh, using it as a cooking liquid because there's starch in there, which means that uh, any curry or any uh, kind of uh, preparation you add this to, the starch is going to kind of thicken as you, as you keep cooking it down. Yeah, so we'll let this soak for a while and uh, what five minutes should do, maybe 15, and then we'll strain it out and that's the water that we're going to use as the mandi, okay? Next step is to blanch the tomatoes and uh, you can avoid the blanching and kind of puree it directly, but I, I like to uh, do this so that I can remove the skin. Okay, so now our um, rice which is soaking and uh, then the next step is to Add in the tamarind. Have about one lemon or lime size ball of tamarind, which you add into this. Um, you let it soak in there. And uh, once the tamarind is kind of soaked, uh, then you kind of squeeze out all the pulp and you take out the seeds and strain it. And then you have that water that's ready to go. Now, I know that a lot of you are a little wary about uh, bindi because of its stickiness and that mucus membrane. Um, I actually don't mind, but if you're really picky about it, uh, what's important to know is the mucus uh, gets activated with uh, water and uh, salt. So those are the two things you want to keep away from it uh, until you cook it. So even if you, I mean, obviously you want to wash the bindi, uh, but even if you wash them, uh, make sure you dry them properly before um, cutting them. And again, you want to have your cutting board and your knife dry as well. And then I'm going to cut them into relatively large pieces, not very small. All right, let's start cooking. Okay, so you want to get a wide and kind of semi-deep pot. Add your um, sesame oil. You can use vegetable oil as well. That's smoking. Let's turn it up, turn it down to low. First thing that goes in is mustard seeds and it's going to splutter very quickly. As soon as it starts to splutter, uh, you want to add a little bit of the hing, the urad dal, the fenugreek seeds. Mix it up nicely. Add your chilies. The onions are shallots going right now. So do the Green chilies, garlic. Then you cook that out for a little bit. That's starting to slightly brown, and uh, they're gonna add the bindi. See if you see this, there's no mucus formation. It's just pretty, it's dry. Now I'm gonna add the curry leaves as well. I like to add curry leaves at a later stage and not the beginning, like a lot of recipes would suggest, because. Uh, it kind of retains, it's somewhere in between where it's kind of retains the freshness but it's still got that cooked flavor. Now I can turn the heat up to a little higher and uh, kind of mix it up. And about now is when I'm going to start seasoning very generously because we haven't had any salt in here. Let's add a pureed tomatoes. We are, we are adding tamarind and tomato, both sour ingredients, so in goes a little bit of sugar. So tomato puree is cooked down a little bit. And uh, this is when I'm going to add the mandi, what makes this dish. And I'm going to strain out the tamarind there. I might still squeeze some of the tamarind if it's not sour enough. And uh, then you bring this to a boil. Let it simmer for a bit. Okay, so this has now been cooking for about, I'm gonna say 10 to 12 minutes. And as you can see, it's uh, kind of reduced to half. So all that water is kind of evaporated and the, the kind of uh, starches in the rice water has kind of made it thicken up. And yeah, I mean, 
since it's bindi it, it, it uh, the vendakai would have kind of uh, cooked already uh, i can turn this off salt levels are good um if it's another vegetable uh, like say if it's beans uh, things like beans carrots you can cook it exactly the way we did with the bindi but if it's things like uh, pumpkin or potato you might want to cook it pa cook it separately and then add it um and that's it and there you have it the chutney on monday perfect with a bowl of nice steamy rice hope you enjoy this enjoyed indeed <laughs> So uh Thomas we have only a couple of minutes left so I want to go to the question about uh sourcing spices because that's a big topic of discussion now and you can talk about the wild food projects there too if you want Sure uh so we realized uh, because for a lot of indian ingredients the supply chain doesn't really exist so we had to create the supply chain we hired someone on our team solely to help us with sourcing who uh, then goes hunting for all these ingredients across the country but a lot of our stuff comes from within Maharashtra, which is the state that Mumbai is in. Uh, so sourcing plays a very important part in what we do. Uh, but when it comes to spices in India, you go to the average uh, kind of spice store uh, uh, in the city, and you already get great spices. It's not. It's, a, it's very different from uh, what you have in America. Well, speaking of America, um, you worked at Bombay Canteen with Floyd Cardos, the beloved chef who did so much for Indian cuisine in the U.S. and who sadly. Uh, passed away at the end of March from COVID, um, and so you know he's educated America hugely in terms of Indian cuisines. What has his perspective, coming from the U.S., brought to the restaurant's vision back in India? I think, uh, I mean, I think Fla Fla Chef Floyd was an iconic uh, chef because he championed uh, Indian food like 20 years ago. So. <laughs> uh he he comes with a lot of like in depth knowledge and experience with trying to make indian food exciting right that's what he did in in, in the us and uh, when we brought brought modern indian food uh, with this philosophy in india we wanted to make sure that we did justice to that and he played a very important role uh, all through in doing that and it's always interesting to see the, the you know the the fact that seasonality or this appreciation of regionalism is something that is new and that is emerging uh, when we tend to look at cuisines like Indian cuisines as these models of plant forward. It, I mean, it's actually very, very old, uh, but it's forgotten and we're trying to bring it back. Uh huh. <laughs> and you're doing that with great success, right? At least in normal times. Yeah, I mean, uh, over the last five years of uh, being open, I think we've managed to convey our philosophy, and now people understand what we're trying to do, and are excited about it. So we have a willing audience who just laps up what we what we kind of serve, I guess. Great. Well, um, we are unfortunately out of time for today, but this is a conversation that could go on forever. And I invite everyone to really join Thomas on Instagram. I think it's the best way to reach you. Is that correct? Absolutely. So my handle is at Chef Tizak. Uh, you can find me there. Great. I post it up up here, but I'll repost it. And uh, we very much look forward to seeing you again, visiting us in the U.S. and to visit you in India. And thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you, Anne. A superstar in the making, as someone just said <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye, Thomas. Thank you. Bye. -bye. And uh, we're now going to a networking break. The video here will show you all of the feature that you will find uh, before going back in the main page. So hopefully you all had a chance to make the zatar, ragu and hummus from the recipe shared on Monday so that we can virtually share a snack, even though we aren't all together. You can use the tabs on the left of your screen to check out a range of ways to engage with everyone who is also attending today. In our sessions tab, we have a special presentation at this break a live demo celebrating protein diversity with Nestle professional representatives Cassie Hoover and chef Logan McCoy, sponsored by Nestle Professional. Throughout all of these activities, we hope you'll ask questions and join the conversation by clicking the green share audio and video button in the expo and breakout sessions. In addition to our event chat, you can direct message any participant by searching for their name under the people tab. A red dot and number next to the envelope on the top right will indicate that you have a new message waiting. When in conversation with another attendee, connect live by clicking the invite to video call button, which will populate a link to a private meeting room. 
Our networking feature matches you with another attendee for a quick four minute chat. Today's networking question is, have you experienced interruptions in purchasing since the pandemic? We encourage you to meet a few new connections each week, just as you might strike up a conversation at the coffee station. At the end of one session, click the ready button again to be paired with another attendee. We encourage you to check out the Expo tab to visit with our sponsors, to watch live demos, hear about new product developments, consumer insights, sustainable operations, or thank them for their support of Menus of Change. And for those of you who are missing the sampling aspects of our in-person programs, head to the virtual tasting booth in the Expo, where you can register your interest in a product sample and virtual tasting experience. The sponsors featured and their theme programming will change week to week, so we hope you'll stop by there often. The themes for this week are listed here, Lastly, don't forget that you are entered in a raffle for each activity you engage in. And if you attend and participate in all six weeks, you'll have a chance to win free registration and travel to next year's Menus of Change Leadership Summit in Hyde Park, New York. We'll be resuming programming on the stage tab at 11.35 a.m. Pacific, 2.35 p.m. Eastern. So go enjoy networking and the expo until then.